Hello and welcome to this evening's Ramadan conversation. We're all in this together. It's presented by the Affinity Intercultural Foundation of Australia. I'm John Cleary and I'll be hosting this series of conversations presented throughout Ramadan. This year, the pandemic of COVID-19 has affected both the Christian season of Easter and the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. And today, in both Australia and New Zealand, it has meant the curtailing of the nation's most solemn Anzac Day ceremonies, when the lives and sacrifice of our war dead are honoured. Ramadan, of course, is characterised by the iftar meal, the breaking of bread amongst friends and neighbours. Last year, Affinity hosted over 45 house iftars and 10 institutional iftars, including up to 350 guests. This year, COVID-19 has made that impossible. So Affinity has decided to carry Ramadan to an online platform, to our living rooms. Ramadan Conversations, we're all in this together, is a daily one hour live Ramadan conversation and each episode will be streamed and later uploaded on Affinity's YouTube page. Our guests will include people from all walks of life, parliamentarians, religious and community leaders, academics and sports celebrities, not only from Australia, but from around the world. And as a former ABC broadcast with a special interest in religion, it's my great pleasure to host these conversations together with a number of assistant hosts drawn from the Muslim community to assist us in our Ramadan conversations. Tonight, we're joined by, by Dr. Mujkan Berish. Dr. Berish is an educationalist with a particular interest in history. She's currently working at Sydney's Amity College as the Compliance Manager, Community Engagement Coordinator and HSC teacher. Dr. Babish, welcome. Thank you, John. Nice to be with you tonight. Well, given your many years in the field of education, I guess the first question that most people would be asking a teacher is how has COVID-19 impacted the schooling system and the students that you work for? Well, uh, of course, like every other school in Australia, it has affected uh, our school, Amity College. Um, uh, it, we're just being lucky that we uh, use um, the uh, computers a great deal in the school. So uh, digital education has been a part of uh, the schooling in Amity for a while. But it, of course, it's online and you don't have face-to-face -face teaching and those children do get affected, of course. And of course, the the bad side of all of this online teaching and learning is um, that there is so much time spent on the computer, and it's it's a disadvantage. It's got its disadvantages, of course, uh, for the health of students as well as just sitting there looking at the screen for hours. So. This term, when we go back, hopefully it'll be less time on screen and more hopefully um, across the board, uh, across all curriculum uh, content, there will be uh, less time on screen, but hands-on activities more, hopefully. So, yes, yeah. <laughs> we're working I, through I it like every be, other yeah, school It's going to be an, on, an ongoing conversation amongst school teachers now for the next couple of years about what this means for the future of yes. education as well. But that could be a whole program in itself. Oh, the other day of significance right. yeah. today is it's, it's Anzac Day. And you uh, are yes. someone of Turkish background and, uh, and parentage. How does being a, an Australian and with Turkish heritage affect you on a day like this? You, you, you're, you're drawn into both sides of a great conversation. Yes, of course. And uh, as I've been gr growing up in Australia, I migrated in 1970 with my parents when I was eight. I grew up with the context of Anzac throughout my life. So it's something that I cherished here as part of the choir at school. I get, went and sang sang at uh, Anzac ceremonies uh, throughout my schooling life because I was always interested in uh, participating in choir. Um, I took part in all of those ceremonies as a, a Turkish Australian as well as, you know, feeling for my fellow uh, uh, soldiers who passed away at the same time as Australian soldiers and New Zealand soldiers. Um, 
and it's a it's a it's it's a experience that um, I think I cherish for both countries, and um, ha, I think it's it means visited, a great deal um, for Anzac me. Have you visited Anzac Cove? Have you visited Anzac Cove yourself? I have. Yes, I've, I, I have. I have gone there uh, twice. Once with a group of uh, teachers, we went, and the other time I, I took students with a fellow colleague, Makiz Ansari. Uh, she went along with me with Mercy College students as well as our students. So. Um, we we went with a group of Amity College students, Mercy College students, and a teacher from Mercy College, and myself and uh, and Makiz Ansari as well. And uh, yes, it's it's been both have been a you great took, experience for me. You took plenty of pictures. <laughs> I did, I did. Yes, I did. I I took lots of photos. The, the, at one stage, the principal of the school was saying, "Don't send any more photos, please." <laughs> <laughs> it must be hard, hard to forget as you walk among those graves at Anzac Cove and, mm. and come upon that, that monument with the words attributed yeah. to Mustafa Kemal about no more Johnnies, no more Mehmets. It, no, it, I mean, that, that, for someone like yourself, um, perhaps you could share a bit of those memories with us. And I understand that somebody's whispered to me that you might have some of those pictures you can show us. I do. I collected them together and put them in a, a little, just a snippet of it. It's not very many of them, but yes, it does bring up. Well, uh, perhaps we can have a look the at them feelings. now and you can tell yes. us about them. They were very, very honoured to be part of that group to go to uh, Turkey. And uh, Gallipoli was a very, um, it was an emotional period for them. I saw some of them actually cry in front of those uh, graves. Uh, we all got very emotional. We walked past the Australian soldiers, New Zealand soldiers, and then towards our own soldiers in Turkey, Turkish soldiers. Um, but yes, it was a it was a, a very emotional period for all of us. You know, it, because I was raised in Australia, I feel part of Australia. And then when I saw the uh, the Turkish soldiers' graves, I, I felt the Turkish side of me swell up. So it was <laughs> emotional, both sides. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How does Amity College, with its strong Turkish heritage and connection, deal with the, the Anzac story and legend today? Well, Amity has always been part of uh, and always every year holds a ceremony um, at Anzac time. Um, you know, uh, we try and embed that into the history, historical curriculum and the, the history teachers put, all, put a program together every year. Um, and in the primary, in the high school, it's being, it's covered all the time. And of course, history is important and every child should know their history well. Um, and with the Turkish background, we've always feel, felt proud that, um, uh, that Australians, part of Austra Australian culture lies within Turkey as well too. So we've taken that initiative as uh, we are all humans and these people have fought for their own country but they are welcomed and all of the Australians were welcomed in Turkey at one stage and uh, they're still welcomed I hope and I haven't been there for years now but uh, and um, that's it's such a shame because uh, you know I, I'd love to go but I haven't had the opportunity to go again. And uh, yes, it's strongly connected to our curriculum as well, yes. Well, Mujkan, thanks so much for, for sharing those observations with us and perhaps we can make a few more as you share the hosting of this program this evening. It's time now <laughs> to turn to, um, to our special guests. And uh, first tonight is Professor Sev Ovzdovsky. He's a member of the Order of Australia and currently the chair of the government's Australian Multicultural Council. In a distinguished career, he has also been Australia's Human Rights Commissioner and Disability Discrimination Commissioner. As mm. a Polish Australian, 
Sev Ozdovsky knows something of the experience of becoming an Australian and the challenges faced by many along that path, particularly children. Dr Ozdovsky is also an educator, currently the Director of the Equity and Diversity Department at Western Sydney University and Honorary Professor in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Sydney. Professor Sev Ozdovsky, welcome to this Ramadan conversation. Thanks so much. Well, for thank you very much, John. Uh, Sev, you've had a long career focused particularly on human rights and one of the significant challenges for Australia over the past generation in particular is becoming a multi-faith society, not simply a multicultural society. How well do you think we've progressed along that path? I think we are doing extremely well. Uh, when I came to Australia in 75, everyone was talking to me about the conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, the issues were discussed if my daughter may marry a Protestant uh, boy uh, in Australia. It was uh, to me uh, simply something extremely exotic. Yes, I never uh, suspected that Australia would be so divided along uh, the religious lines. And of course, since 75, we had many other new migrants coming and we had migrants coming who never been here before in large number, bringing their religions, bringing their faith. And uh, by now, I think we are very much at peace uh, with different religions and uh, all the religions, I believe, are making quite good contribution to social cohesion and to the way we are creating the Australian culture for the future. Hmm. What do you think are the, are the needed steps that remain? Your observation is, is particularly contemporarily relevant. Um, you, you look at the, 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 the work done by interfaith groups, various interfaith groups across the community, and I'm thinking of work such as Affinity is presenting tonight. What do you think are the, the opportunities that, that remain for multi-faith organisations to do some work in the community? What, what do you see as the key points? I think the key point is that uh, we need to acknowledge that Australia is basically a secular society and uh, when you look at uh, our last census there are not that many people actively uh, participating in a religious life. But having said so, religions do establish values. Religions do bring a relationship between different communities. And I think for the first time ever in Australia, religions are not at war with each other, but religions are working closely together trying to advance what really is important in our humanity. And in a way, therefore, I became so attracted to the affinity. And I must say, I knew very little about uh, Islamic religion before I came to Australia. And I first met people from affinity when I was human rights commissioner, but then joining the Western Sydney University where we have many Muslim students, I was actively looking for organizations which could help me to understand a bit more about the religious commitment. And affinity was extremely good group because it was focusing not on the religious differences, but at what is uniting us. It was, in a way, the best model of how to work in Australian civil society because affinity very much seeks to create better understanding, deepen the relationship between different people. Affinity also is organizing intellectual uh, public events, uh, which uh, are very uh, interesting to go through and, and stimulating. So looking really back at my contacts with Affinity, I must say on personal level, Affinity helped me to understand much more deep and modern Islam and associations of people, aspirations of people uh, of Muslim faith and contemporary Australia, but on broader level, I really do appreciate the work they are doing to advance social cohesion and peace in Australia. 
Mushkan, perhaps if I could, an yep. educationalist on that. Uh, perhaps if I could add, I really believe that organizations like Affinity, they very much uh, contributed to removal of bigotry and racism in our uh, society. And also, I think they helped many young Muslims to operate within the modern Australian society. Well, Sev, yeah. Um, Sev, I'd like to ask a question. Welcome to our program, by the way. Uh, you've been Thank involved you. in a wide range of iftars, and you've been you've uh, attended both uh, institutional iftars and uh, organised iftars with Western Sydney University. How do you see these iftars contributing to the community? <laughs> you see, I'm I. I was organizing iftars at the Western Sydney University. I also attended a number of them. And I must say there were years uh, when I was thinking, oh God, let's have this Ramadan over because too many iftars are happening. <laughs> but, but, but allow me to say that the iftar, it's something very specific which didn't exist before in Australian culture. This massive emergence of iftars over the last, last 10 years or more, and also the importance of them, the fact that they are organized in parliament, that prime ministers, premiers, ministers, VIPs are attending them, everyone would like to be seen and associated with it, means very important shift in Australian culture and I would like to congratulate uh, the Muslim community of mm. Australia for taking this initiative and on such a scale, because I don't know of any other ethnic group which joined the society, mm -hmm. which would be so open and inviting to other groups with their culture. And I think, I think it's enormous achievement. And in a way, sorry, this year we can't do it uh, because of the virus. But but I look toward uh, uh, participating next year. Yes, so affinity and a little about. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Sev, we've we've chatted a little about um, uh, Anzac Day. Uh, already in this conversation. You're a migrant from uh, from Poland as a child. You grew up in a country particularly ravaged by the worst of World War II and then the years of communist rule. How has this sort of experience shaped your views of days such as Anzac Day and what we should gain out of them or look for in them? Well, Anzac, when I came to Australia, it was a new thing for me and I in a way didn't understand very much logic of it uh, because Australian went to fight a war in a faraway country not really their own war plenty of people young people died and uh, uh, Anzac emerged in Turkey in Anzac Cove uh, the celebration where we basically fought a battle which didn't make too much sense and we lost it. So to start with, I didn't understand it very much. Uh, but <laughs> over the time, I understood much better the sacrifice Australia made for our and their freedom. I also have been a vice president of Polish ex Servicemen Association for uh, seven years in Canberra. So I participated in every Anzac uh, march when I was uh, living in Canberra. And uh, then I was privileged to take a part in Affinity sponsored uh, tour of uh, uh, to Gallipoli. And I took part with my wife in early morning ceremony at Anzac Cove. Mm -hmm. And it made he, uh, really an uh, interesting for example, I, I do celebrate Anzac now. I think it's enormous unifying uh, thing for all Australians. Of course, this morning I couldn't go and participate in it. So we just put in our house of isolation here in Vincentia, mm. uh, Australian flag on little must we had, had in front of our house and la uh, lighted a candle. Uh, 
so it's part of of history which which you've got to learn to like it to understand and to be part of it mm. professor sev ofzovsky we've run out of time we've run out of time thank you thanks for joining us and now uh, uh, it, it's time for a little music so we're music. off to melbourne so we're off for an melbourne. iconic for turkish iconic song turkish from karnakali or gallipoli as we know Gallipoli. it's by yeah. musician and by educator musician. dr gushi erkishir let's go off yes. to melbourne Thank you, wow. Gushi, for that uh, delightful song. Uh, perhaps, uh, Mushkan, you can uh, 
give us a little idea of what the lyrics are. We picked up the word Janakali a number of times during the chorus, yes. but uh, what's the spirit of the song? Um, it's, been, it's a song about being uh, shot on the, uh, the shores of uh, uh, Anzac Cove, Gallipoli area, and uh, being buried there. Uh, so the whole song is about um, going, fighting and being killed on the shores of Gallipoli. It really could be sung by soldiers from both sides, couldn't it? Uh, yes, it could be, yeah. If we could teach it yeah. to... And we do some in our music classes. I'm sure Ghazi Bay has taught them to various multicultural Australians <laughs> in the past, I'm sure, yes. Ghazi, oh, uh, we, should get, uh, we should get some words and stick them up on the, uh, on the site yeah. so that people can sort of <laughs> play, play it again and listen to those words. Listen to it. Along. It's a very, yeah. it's a very heartfelt uh, song. It uh, it just mm. brings back a lot of emotions, I think, to me and, as well. And the town mm. is the town is not far away from Anzac Cove itself. So, for the townspeople no. mm. around that area, it's a sort of personal mm. meaning, I guess. Yeah. It yeah. does, yes, of course, and it unfortunately becomes touristic, like every other, uh, you know, historical site. But uh, yes, the the people. There, Chanakale is, is, you know, warm, helpful. They like uh, helping people out and uh, explaining the history around that area as well too, yes. Yeah, I, I did notice we, a few boomerangs when I went shops person, when, yeah. when I was there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, yes, of course. They would catch on to those boomerangs very quickly, yes, I'm sure. <laughs> but when we went, we had our personal, uh, when we took over the students, we went through the town of Chanakal and then um, we had our own tourist uh, guide with us. So he explained a lot of historical issue, events there as well too, yeah. And it was very just good for both sides. Just coming back to your own sides. experience, mm -hmm. yeah, just coming back to your own experience for a couple of minutes while, we, um, while we're waiting for our next yes. guest. Um, as an educator, you've got a particular challenge these days in dealing with young people mm. who, while seeking to preserve much of their own traditions, are still being dragged mm. off into a whole new world. And, and for kids, mm. that can be something of a tension, particularly at home, if the parents think that a shift in mm. culture is a loss of values. Uh, yes, I, I can personally that understand issue? that. I can personally understand that because I went through that when I was growing up. So I can understand children being stuck in both cultures. Um, yes, they can. Um, and it's, it's, it's easier for us at our school because uh, there's a multitude of cultures represented at the school. So they don't feel that they're, uh, you know, um, that they're being isolated in one way or another. So it's not... Um, I went to an old Aussie uh, school, for instance, like all the, uh, there was only me or a couple of Turkish girls in one class. Uh, and I went to Summerhill Public School when I first arrived in Australia. And it was, I was surrounded by Australians, which was, which meant that I was the uh, outsider, you know, and you felt it at those da in those days. But I think kids these days are very, much more luckier in that respect because they they feel that they are part of Australia because they've been born here, they're raised. Some of their parents have been born here and are raised. Uh, like they, uh, I've been raised here, my son was born here. So he feels the culture of Turkey is important to him, but he also feels very much at home in Australia. So I think that's the way that we as educators need to bring our kids up. Yes, you need to remember where you're from and what your identity is, where your roots are from, but you also need to make sure that you understand Australia, the Australian way of life and the Australian culture so you can fit in very well and accommodate yourself with Australians. And uh, that's, that to me is very important because we don't, as you know, as a Muslim, we're isolated in one way or another, thanks to, uh, you know, media, mm -hmm. and media plays yeah. up on that a great deal. But we need to know our f identity and be proud of our identity. And that's, as a teacher, that's our initial aim. 
It's not whether they're from Turkey, they're from Lebanon, they're from all different Bosnia, you know, Fiji, you know, from the islands. Uh, they come to yeah, our school. I'm, they need to know the background, where they're coming from, and know and the values of Australia. Come from a f I'm thinking of where you could come from, the difficulties, where you could come from a faith tradition, and I'm speaking about any mm. faith tradition in our That's society right, yeah. today, and people tend to regard, um, f many people regard faith-based schools as schools to keep their kids isolated from the world to trap them no, back that's, in yeah. the tradition, to no. keep them in the tradition, not to be polluted no. by the world. Is that, is, mm. that a, a, mm. is that a tension for Amity in particular, how to deal with that mm. sort of understanding? Because it's very common, whether you're Christian or Muslim or Jewish, that you expect that of yes. a faith-based school. Yes, uh, Amity is very different in that respect though. Uh, Amity finds that dialogue is the important aspect to re, uh, ensure that there is a holistic development of the child. So they need to know the other to be able to understand themselves better. So we need to have that uh, oh, communication with no. other schools, no. Uh, no. like we did with Mercy College. So we took them over to Turkey and Gallipoli, those girls from Mercy College. But it was an important uh, relationship bonding uh, time for us and they understood Islam as well as the Turkish culture and we understood uh, Christianity because we took them to the, uh, to the uh, churches uh, in Istanbul for instance and uh, we went into the church and we understood Christianity uh, so it, it was important for our students to understand Christianity as yeah. well yeah. so yes it's it's a it's a dialogue that Amity encourages in all our students, yes, I think. Yes. Hagia Sophia being a particularly potent example <laughs> yes. of a place that's been home to a number yeah. of faiths. Yeah. Well, thanks that's for that. Right. And it's time now to, uh, to introduce our next guest. Emeritus Professor Ross Chambers served as Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Charles Sturt University, first as Dean and then as Deputy Vice-Chancellor, mm -hmm. Professor Chambers, over Chambers oversaw the establishment of theology, Islamic studies and uh, interfaith programs at Charles Sturt and for his services to education was awarded a member of Australia. Uh, Ross Chambers, welcome mm -hmm. to, uh, to this special Ramadan conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Ross, can you hear me? We can hear you very clearly, yes. Oh, great. <laughs> Welcome, well, thanks Ross. for being there. Um, you probably get a little closer to the mic if you, if you can. Um, sure. Ross, you've been a prime mover in the introduction of uh, religious studies at a tertiary institution. Why? Well, I think it's really important in our society that people understand the role of, of, of people's faith. I think we're coming out of a, a period, I think partly driven by one of the forces behind a kind of secularization, which is to try and avoid religious conflicts in society and the long history of tension between Christian groups in Australia, to a point I hope where we can see that people uh, contribute to society by speaking about the things they think are most important. That, that religion doesn't have to be a private matter, but that it can come in validly to the, to the public sphere. And I think part of that is ensuring that the scholarly traditions of uh, the religious traditions in our community have a place within the home of scholarship, which is the, which is the university. And uh, I was very keen to see theology take its place within the university system, and then also to see the scholarly traditions of Islam uh, become part of the university uh, discourse as well. Hmm. Globally, religion remains the prime cultural driver for most of humanity. Yet in the West, as you've indicated, the opposite seems to be happening. For much of the community, religion seems to be in terminal decline. Why do you think the apparent paradox? I think that on the surveys for Australia, there's still a high proportion of people who declare some kind of interest in religion. I think it may not necessarily be a connection with one of the 
if you like, established churches or established faith faith traditions. But I think even in Western societies, there's still quite a lot of interest in that dimension of that dimension of life, even if people's relationship to it or people's engagement with it is perhaps a little bit more um, diffuse these days. Mm. I think part of that is, and there are no other factors here, but part of that is the the sense we've had in our community that maybe the best thing to do is to sort of privatise religion and to leave mm. religion out of public public discourse. Um, the, the, yes. the image I often have of those kind of westerns, you know, where people are meant to leave their guns at the door when they go into the saloon <laughs> or people <laughs> go into the public space to leave their religious beliefs behind. And I think, I actually think that's changing and that we have, a, a, there, there is a, a more of an openness because of the salience of religion, as you say, in so much of the world. I think there is a mm. sense now that perhaps it's important for people to be able to bring their religious convictions into the public, into public discourse. And, mm. and personally, I, I, I feel that we owe some of that to our, our Muslim community because people in the Muslim community, I think, have been very, um, as it were, faithful in, in coming mm. to public discourse with their religious convictions. And I think that's open space for lots of other people as well. Yeah. In a way, that uh, point you mentioned is the seed of both positivity and negativity because m many people would agree that the great religions are profoundly civilizational. That is, they, they shape a culture at its deepest points. But that's the very thing they fear. I think that's right in, in some respects. But I, I mean, I, uh, one of my good friends is, is the, the social commentator, Hugh McKay. And I think some of Hugh's writing on Australians' attitudes to religion shows that people are more willing to engage with religion in, in certain ways than perhaps than perhaps we think. And one of the couple of the points Hugh makes, for instance, in, in his recent books is that while people often have grave reservations about the, the sort of institutional church, they actually like having church communities in their community or, or faith communities in their community because they think there are people there that are, mm. are kind of serious and 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 uh, kind yes. and so on. And another point that Hugh made in that book was what he called uh, faith envy. That is, that there are quite a lot of people who would sort of like to believe, but not quite sure that mm. they they really do. So I think we 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 live in a kind of in, in a kind of world where there's space for. Uh, religions to engage with, with people and and obviously I think you know in the context we're in now when we're thinking about Ramadan and that wonderful tradition of the the, the community iftars that's been another mm. area I think where the Muslim community has you know shown real real leadership what can we learn Mushkan, from that do you think yes yes John I was just going to ask what do you think that other religions could learn from that and how could we share into their religious uh, um, you know uh, faith-based traditional uh, you know uh, like the iftars uh, is there anything that the other religions can do maybe to uh, open their arms to the community as we have probably with iftars through affinity um, in our own homes you know we open up our homes during the month of Ramadan, not this year, of course, but in previous years, we've opened up our homes and had people that we had not met before come in for iftars. Uh, do you think other religions could do similar things in one way or another? Look, I think one of the great human values, which is embodied in many of the traditions, religious traditions or faiths, is hospitality. Hospitality mm. is a wonderful thing. And mm. Ramadan and the iftars are great examples of hospitality. I think that's true of many faiths. And I think that sort of meeting people over a meal, for instance, is something that lots of people value and that lots of people mm. practice. And certainly the tradition of the iftar and that openness and hospitality at Ramadan is a, is a great example of mm. that. Um, we've, I've just been looking at some research associated with the National Christian Life Survey, which is a survey mm -hmm. of attitudes within congregations, you know, across Australia that's conducted. Mm -hmm. And one of the, and they also looked at people who perhaps were on the fringes of churches as well as regular attenders. And one of the things that people 
most valued and were most responsive to was the opportunity to sit down with other people and just talk. Mm -hmm. And I think hospitality mm -hmm. is a wonderful, there's just a, a, a great value that we find certainly at the heart of Islam, <laughs> but also I yes. think it's a, mm -hmm. it's a value in many other, and many other religions. And I think that that's something we're all learning about even more now, I guess, in a way when we're mm -hmm. forced into isolation we kind of miss, yeah, well, we appreciate. Like we miss that hospitality and that opportunity to be hospitable <laughs> to each other. On the other hand, you can see wonderful ways in which people are finding the opportunity to be hospitable to each other, even in these circumstances. Yeah. It's just the value that people place on them. Yes. In, in this period I, yeah. of, of sort of... Yes, in this period of waning faith in institutional religion, as you say, in Australia, for many Australians, a day like today, Anzac, seems as close to an authentic religious experience as many Australians have. Um, and it's interesting that unlike many other national war commemorations, Anzac gains its symbolic power not for a flag waving about victory, but for the pain of defeat, self-sacrifice for no material gain. And that's a profoundly religious understanding. I think that's right, and I, I mean, I, I certainly, as, as a sort of historian, as, uh, and also feel that there are, you know, forms of religion or, or attitudes and so forth that perhaps have a manifest themselves in some ways in other, more formal kind of religion, are, are very deeply rooted in our communities and and transform into into uh, activities activities like that, and I think it shows not just the, the respect for values, like the willingness to sacrifice oneself for one's fellows, but also that strong sense that people have of what you might call not just human interdependence, which is being greatly strengthened now, I think, as we, we sit in our homes and really miss each other and realise how much we rely on each other, but not just that sense of interdependence as it were, across our current society, but that inter interdependence across time. And I think when we mm. look at Anzac Day, we're seeing people's understanding of the fact that they're part of a tradition, they're, we're where we are now because of what our forebears have done. We rely on other people, not just for our well-being now, but we rely on other people who've gone before us and we hope to be able to pass something on to our children. And I think that's something that's led to perhaps the strengthening of the, um, the, Anzac, the Anzac tradition. I think people comment that it seems to get almost stronger every year. Mm -hmm. As a student of religion, how will you come to see this year as both Easter and Ramadan have been held quite literally in the shadow of death? I mean, do you, do you have any Ramadan observations or, or observations about the fact that these things are coming together against a powerful symbol like that, that's of, of continuing use to the community? Yes, and I should say in the community of Port Macquarie, where I live, we're, we're coming to that after absolutely unprecedented bushfires. There have never been anything yes. like that in beautiful Port Macquarie. And so mm. that... Uh, COVID virus comes after we've spent much of the summer sort of locked out at our homes, surviving the smoke and so forth. So it's been a very strange experience. Um, at our and at our church, the church I go to, which is um, meeting obviously by, by Zoom, our our service on Easter Sunday, we we built the service around that um, that psalm which was a popular song many, some years ago. How shall we sing a new song in the Lord's land? In, how shall we sing a new song? How, we, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a new land? Old song. And, and which is a wonderful psalm actually. And we, we sort of tried to think we are entering new spaces and how shall we sing the Lord's song in a new land? And I think mm. that's true for all religions. I mean, one of the things that I really admire about my colleagues in the School of Islamic Studies at CSU 
is the effort they make to build on tradition but confront the new circumstances in which we're all living. And I think that's true of the best Christian thought as well. And so my, I guess my thought for, for everybody as, as we face Ramadan in a new way and as we face um, Easter in a new way and as we start to emerge from this and emerge from the environmental disasters that we've all faced it is, is, you know, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a new land? Ross Chambers. Thank so you much. for so much for uh, for joining us. Um, Mushkan, uh, Ross has some challenges for all of us, whatever the faith traditions are. I know. Yes, I can. Un I can feel you from here. Um, I do. Uh, after the fires and everything else, yes. Right. Ross, thanks for your time. Uh, Ross Chambers, uh, and uh, a, a great contribution to the program this evening. It's begun to have you with us. And uh, Mujan, uh, time now to turn again to Melbourne. And uh, another song, this yeah. time with something uh, close to the heart of many at Affinity, something from the Sufi tradition. Sufi. <laughs> Song of Sufi, uh, uh, Hopefully, next time I will sing a Sufi, a Sufi song. Oh, mm -hmm. bir tek dostuna, her köşesi cennettir, ezilir yanar içim. Başkadır benim memleketim. Lay, 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 Lay 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 la 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 Thank you, Gucci. That was uh, wonderful <laughs> stuff. Beautiful. Uh, and uh, again, we, we probably uh, we should try and get a translation up eventually, but um, uh, yes. that's not our privilege tonight. But Mushkan, perhaps you could tell but us. But I can, I can, I can tell you a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for you this time, John. <laughs> right. 
it's a, it's about our country. It's about his nation. He's talking about and the the great things about his nation, which is uh, friendship. Bonds are fantastic. The friendships are, are great. Mevlana, born again issue, the home of the Mevlana and globally well known and appreciated by the world, um, the world in dervishes as well. Choban, uh, everyone sings, everybody is happy, harmonious, even the shepherds are singing across the countries. So his, his nation his, uh, is such a different place to him in his heart. Our Ghazi, well, our music That's teacher, Mr. Ghazi. Yes, that's what Thank the song you so is much for virtually that. about. <laughs> well, time now to introduce our final guest for tonight, Dr. Kathy Ahare. Kathy, welcome to you. Kathy Ahare has spent over 40 years in academic life and education at secondary and tertiary levels. As the first year experience coordinator at the University of Technology in Sydney, she co-leads a program designed to support first year students from low socioeconomic status backgrounds. She and her late partner, Professor Alan Knight, made a significant contribution over the years to the development of Affinity through its advisory board. Kathy Hare, welcome to this Ramadan conversation. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Mijan. Kathy, um, how did you first come across Affinity? Well, Alan was invited to um, an iftar dinner, home dinner, many, many years ago probably 2012, 2013, 12 maybe. And um, um, Amit um, was the um, host in that, that evening. And Affinity, uh, I, I wasn't sure what the story, what was going to be about. And I saw the lovely sharing and I'm very much aware of connection and, and people um, warm and compassionate. And I really enjoyed that this, the stories around the table, the sharing of food. But the one image that comes to my mind was um, when I was asking Amit about the affinity or the Muslim religion that um, for me to understand a little bit more, he talked about, uh, uh, perhaps I was asking him about the roles of males and females. And he said, there's a bird, when you think about a bird, it has two wings, one's male, one's female, unless they're in harmony the bird can't fly. And I thought, ah, that's a fantastic concept. And, and it made me start thinking, ah, there's a little bit more to know about this religion and about affinity, about mm. the group. And from that, I moved in, um, we went across to um, Turkey um, with the affinity group. And I understood a lot more about um, the Hizmet movement and, uh, and the compassion that people have and the sharing and the giving. And then um, I have from that point, and, and it was probably from that point that I came to more and more events and um, found the dialogue and the sharing. Um, and then the Ramadan time, coming into home dinners, uh, iftas, sharing, meeting people from quite diverse backgrounds, as well as the host family. Um, it's been a very, very strong, um, well, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a passionate time for me where I love bringing friends to say, come and meet these wonderful people. You'll learn so much about um, a way of working, a way of living that, that is really um, bringing in the depths of, of people's compassion and sharing and dialogue and connection. It's interesting here, uh, Mushkan, I'll get you to comment on this too, if you would. Yes. It's interesting that following the conversation with uh, Professor Chambers there, there seems to be an emphasis that people are prepared to take an interest in religion if that religion is revealed in action. It, it's, the mm. emphasis seems to be shifting from right belief to right action. They don't, don't, mm. don't tell me, show me, seems to be the, the mark of authenticity, if you like. Uh, where would you go first? And perhaps you could uh, make an observation about what Cathy's had to say. Yes, uh, I, I think that's true in a lot of ways. Uh, it's what I do is, you know, that makes uh, the religion part of me. So, um, yes, our religion has a lot of actions involved that uh, our prophet always displayed his actions first and then expected others to follow. 
Um, he did everything that he expected people to do, firstly himself, and then he expected others to follow. So we need to show our understanding and our love and concern for others before we can expect them to show understanding towards us. So I think, yes, whatever we can do for humanity is important. And I think as humans, we need to take on responsibilities for those who are less privileged than us and, uh, and are more needy than ourselves. And if we're, uh, we, expect, uh, we say we are religious, then we must act on our religion that expects us to be um, sharing with those who are less uh, less privileged than ourselves in income ways or you know uh, they might need uh, social assistance or they might need company or they might need all sorts of different variety of things that we may have and we can start sharing with others and that's yeah. what I think all religions are based on really because uh, religion to us is helping others as well, especially in the month of Ramadan, it becomes more and more important. It's the openness. I think the openness and the acceptance and then working yeah. with people and building through. Yeah. Um, I feel very strong, a strong affinity, using the word, to that um, in my own work where it's about, as you say, de demonstrating the example and to bring people, academics, I work, work with academics and academics tend to be quite isolated and work in their own discipline but to bring them together and mm. to share and and mm. um, model that connection um, which is what I see I see they're very similar connections between the way uh, affinity into foundation um, cultural foundation works and my own thinking that so mm. it's it's as John says it's the the actual experience and modeling, but there's a, there's, it's touching people in inside the compassion. I think that's part of, you know, the value system, the joining and the feeling mm. that they belong. And they, they yeah. Kathy, that, that seems to link too, to your attitude, to your role as an educator, that, that in some ways you're serving the mm. whole person, the, the role you're doing. Uh, this year with COVID-19, that must present some, some really well, stressful situations for you. Well, I run big events. I try to bring lots of people from all the dif different disciplines together and share and, and get them to connect around practice and then bring some good examples of practice and then discuss an activity. And just this week, I moved it onto an online space. And so I needed to be able to create the same concept of people sharing in small groups. So fortunately, Zoom has breakout groups, so I experimented with mm. that. Um, and topics and then um, we did an hour and a half I knew you needed breaks um, and I knew knew that we needed to have a lot of movement um, um, speakers who've got good information a range of um, from students to academics to professional staff counseling and we we actually had the topic of thriving as being mm. the way of working looking at where we are now and where would we like to be going and how do we how do we thrive within this COVID nineteen environment? Given the whole push to be online, and and I I must say that I've noticed the academics who who do thrive. They they look at opportunities. They take opportunities. And they think about how can the students feel that they can belong in the online space. How can we touch out, reach out, touch, um, and show some care. Um, allow time for some social engagement between students because they're not in the same room anymore. Um, and so just to be able to share that way of working with others and then draw out an energy. Um, yes, I, it does um, fit quite nicely. And so COVID has actually been an opportunity for us to me to, to experiment and think about different ways of working. Mm. Kathy, mm. we're just about out of time. Uh, oh, okay. It's given us a lot to think about. It's just wonderful for you to be with us this <laughs> evening. Thank you so much. And well, Mushgan, that's just about it from us as well. Uh, thank thanks you. for joining in today's program thank yourself. You. I thank look you, forward Kathy. to talking with you as a co-presenter uh, co uh, later in this series. 
Uh, and thank you all at home John. for joining us, wherever you happen to be for joining us for this Ramadan conversation. Our next episode will be on Monday. And if, we, if you wish to view this or any of the series of Ramadan conversations, you can find them on the Affinity YouTube channel. Stay safe and have a blessed Ramadan.